It's said that you can see a lot by just looking. Well, that's the case with exploratory data analysis. The thing about exploratory data analysis, we use the graphs to tell us what's going on. We don't actually focus on the data analysis itself. The tools are going to present us with a graphical image, and in interpreting that graphical image, we'll understand what's going on. So we see the four up chart, for instance, and what we start seeing is in this individual's chart, we can see where are their problems in productivity. The capability analysis tells us how well that performance is happening from the actual state to the ideal state. The Pareto chart tells us where the issues are, and the process uh, um, chart in terms of the ANOVA and step by step tells us which subgroup is the one we need to drill down into next. So if we take a look at the uh, individual, uh, excuse me, at the ANOVA chart, what we see is that here is a process. We see a red line for talk time. Talk time is the cycle time that it takes to get orders incoming. So we'd like to be respondent to that. And that means our process should be less than talk time. And we see that there's an urgent need for improvement because one process step is clearly above this. So that is the, the problem, if you will, that we're having. One step in the process is excessive cycle time. So one of the things we would like to do as we're looking at our process is to look at it as a time-based measurement system. So talk time, we calculate very easily. It's a time available to do work divided by the volume of incoming data. So it's an average statistic that tells us, on general, this is how responsive our system needs to be. Now, if we take a look at this, we can follow up that ANOVA by taking a look inside that process data and tell us what type of time was actually spent doing the work. To do this, we use what's called a Yamazumi diagram. So Yamazumi literally means a stacked up bar chart. And we can create these in Excel. They don't actually create very well in Minitab. But the Yamazumi chart shows us, do we have balance in the work? So we take a look at those process steps. We see, wait a minute, that manufacturing step, it has a lot of non-value adding work in it. Now, the problem is we look at that, we should go and say, where is that work coming from? So now we can take a look at that work and say, okay, based on that, we have different tar charts of uh, the Pareto here telling us how much non-value adding time is contributed for each of the process steps going through there, and we see that it's coming from subcontracting and engineering. And those processes are preceding, if you will, the manufacturing process. So how do we want to use this manufacturing performance monitoring system? Well, what we do, we do is once we get this understanding of where we have a problem, and we see that one sort of red box plot here, the next thing we want to do is take the individual's data for that, the capability for that one process step, the understanding of the failure mechanisms and frequency occurrence with the Pareto, and then take a look at the substats of that process using this ANOVA chart and then perhaps another Yamazumi diagram. And in doing this, what we do is we follow, this is like following the one piece flow, and we're gonna understand where is the bottleneck actually occurring? What's happening in there? And so we see in the symptoms in that manufacturing step, but maybe the origins of the process weren't there. And this is why we have to sometimes do this spaghetti diagram walk. Because we go to manufacturing and we start seeing some of those problems actually came from someplace else. Well, purchasing was buying things and they didn't have the right purchase orders. So manufacturing is including all the subcontractors who couldn't work, so they had waiting time to get it right. Purchasing didn't get it right because engineering didn't have the specifications. Engineering didn't have the right specifications because the customer orders weren't complete. So we're gonna pull back the onion piece by piece as we walk through the diagram and try to find out what was the real source of the problem. So in this, we can see this use of the five whys, step by step going back. The data showing us the pictures of what's going on. And at the end, we have now sort of an idea of the causality of the systems and why this manufacturing step is operating so inefficiently over time. So in Japan, we see that there's what they call six losses that typically occur in a process. And this is the difference between whether a process operates at the ideal level or at the actual level. So sometimes it can be a process breakdown. Sometimes it'll be a slowdown or a work stoppage. Sometimes it will be because of rework and defects in the process or quality problems.
Sometimes it takes too long to set up the process, and sometimes after the setup, it takes too long to get the startup and stabilize the process. And then other times we just see the cycle times for the normal operation process are too long. So as we start looking at these and we start identifying where the times are happening and what's occurring, we can generate, if you will, a better view of how to make the improvement happen. Now, we've talked about the five whys. And many times the five whys is just processing anecdotes, someone's story or their opinion about what happens. So what we'd like to do is, as we're using these five whys, think about the set of analytic tools that will help us to explain what's going on a little bit better and take it out of the world of opinion and put it more into a factual display. So the first why may be just about the overall context. And we can use a pie chart and say, we're gonna attack this percentage of the problem. Now we go into that percentage of the pie, that slice of the pie, we take all of that data, look at it in history with the individual charts. And now we're asking why, what happened as a function of time? And as we take a look at that function of time and we can segregate the good from the bad, the bob from the wow, we can ask what actually happened? What were the reasons for this? And we can accumulate those in the Pareto chart. Next, we can define the strength of the relations by looking at those factors physically in the sequence of time and find out what was the time impact of those changes in the physical world as one piece flows through that process sequentially from the beginning through the end. And finally, if we want to model that, we can start moving into a more advanced approach and use regression analysis to understand how do we actually calculate the formula for that. But at that point in time that we're getting into regression, we're actually moving into the more advanced steps out of exploratory data analysis and now into actually understanding the remedial possibilities in the process. So EDA gets us down to that step, individuals charts, capability studies, Pareto charts, ANOVA, and then drilling down the next time again to a new individuals charts, capability studies, Pareto, and ANOVA. So by repeating that step time and time again, we start becoming smart about what's actually going in on the process. And that's really what the value of exploratory data analysis is about. It gives us this understanding, where should we focus this process for improvement? And it also tells us what was the rationale behind many of the decisions that have been made about the past, and also some idea of the causality when the process did these things, what were the resulting effects in terms of the outcome performance measures. So at this point in time, we're ready to enter the measure phase, and we're ready to go and understand much more detailed what's going on in the process. Now before we do that, there's one more thing we have to do before we enter the measure phase to accumulate accumulate our, our knowledge, if you will, out of defined. So in our last video in this series, we'll return back to the project charter.